What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Walkout Network. It's your man, Ant Walker, here with another edition of Unleashed, the weekly panel discussion show. Of course, I'm joined by the fantastic gentleman, the duo uh, from Sherdog.com that you know oh so well. First up, the jack of all trades who has mastered them all, the senior editor over there, Mr. Ben Duffy. Ben, what's up? Hey, I'm doing really well. It's uh, it's good to be back. Good to be talking to you guys on this Thanksgiving week. Absolutely. And that's a beautiful shirt you're wearing, by the way. I have to point out. And it, Wu-Tang gets Pretty plenty good. of love in, in, in this household. And of course, the man who anchors the panel every week with the stats, the facts, the figures, and the numbers, the associate editor of Sherdog.com. Also, my good friend, Mr. Jay Petrie. You know, the fight cards this weekend were, were very, very meh. And yet, I still found myself more excited to be able to sit down and talk with you boys than worry about the fights. Like I like the fights happen and I'm like, oh boy, the fights were whatever. But then I thought, oh man, that means on Monday we get to talk about them and rip on them or 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 get our thoughts out or whatever we have to do. So I'm I'm happy about that. That you know what honestly I I wanted to say the same thing actually uh at some point during the show because that was really the the best thing about sitting through a pretty tough fight card was knowing, all right, we're going to get to spill out everything that we're feeling about this um, on, on Monday. So I'm like the two guys, two of the guys that I reach out to first during a fight or after a fight to get like immediate reactions and thoughts whenever. And like, we'll get to talk about it all uh, here. So I'm, I'm excited. So despite the I, fact not being excited on Saturday. Yeah. It's funny how that works. I, Cause I was excited about something, but it didn't, pan out the way i wanted it to but i still was excited about it and it's my stat of the week and it's 43 because lupi godinez lupita godinez actually is her name not lupi that's her nickname uh fought for the third time in the octagon in 43 days that's a modern record obviously not with the old ufc tournaments those are going to stand forever uh but that's a pretty impressive turnaround she wants to fight again in december if she can so 43 for lupi and yeah, that's and, about and like she, that's about oh. the number of nicknames she has. Because yeah. while I haven't seen it, I almost guarantee you her birth certificate says Guadalupe on it as her first I, name. I, I would so be surprised. At home in Mexico, they called her Lupita. When mm -hmm. she moved to Canada, they were like, "Oh, your name is Lupi." I, I guarantee you, she picked up the nickname in Canada. Like, it drives me nuts that the Sherdog Fight Finder has two different versions of her real name, like you know, like as her name and nickname. And it's probably one of the only fights I can think of that both the fighters were the UFC fights where both the fighters went off nicknames for their names. Like the UFC bills her as Lupi Gudinez, mm -hmm. and they bill Konklag Supasara as Loma Lukbo and Me, which is her fight name. So it's yep. it's pretty funny. I mean, we'll we'll stick with Lupi um or Lupita because the only Lupe that we acknowledge is Fiasco. So let's uh Here we go. keep yeah, I mean one of the greatest lyricists of all time, but that's a whole nother story. Um, let's go ahead and first off, hit that like button, subscribe, share, tell a friend to tell a friend, tell that friend to tell 10 more friends. Uh, now, UFC Fight Night 198, I think it was, the hashtag was UFC Vegas 43. Yeah. Um, it happened. Like, it happened. Like, we know it happened because we were there. Uh, well, not physically. We were in front of our te televisions watching it. Are we better off for this never have happened or or just can we just go on like no one noticed? It's one of those cards where not I mean, obviously, it was kind of dull from an entertainment perspective, but you're, you're going to get some duds when you're running 45 cards a year. They can't all be bangers. But how many of the fighters on this card, even individually, came off looking really, really good and raised their stock? I can think of, of about two. You know, we're just uh, unequivocally, you can say, OK, that person's stock is up after this event. Otherwise, you know, you got the main event where, yeah, someone won, but I don't feel a whole ton better about her. Yeah, it's like that's what makes it a tough card. I, I can sit through a boring card from time to time. It's going to happen. But uh, yeah, I just I didn't learn much. That's that's it. That right there is that last sentence. And, and I felt uncomfortable coming into this card looking at it going there's not a lot we can take from this card like the the possibilities for the wild thing to happen still in the scheme of things and in the ufc rankings and the sure dog rankings and whatever else relevance we try and talk about wasn't a whole lot that could come from that uh like 
you know, what happens if Tyler Santos comes out and blows blows out Joanne Calderwood? Okay, that's something, but, you know, well, what, where do we go from there? Sean Brady comes out. If he comes out and, and submits Michael Chiesa, okay, but he's not up next for Usman or something. So it's, it's, it's the stories that come out afterwards that I feel should be the most important about what are the ramifications, what, where do we go from here? And the results kind of added compounded to the fact that it was very very dull is that not only was it just agonizing to watch the first eight fight goes go the distance or that not many of them were that compelling and exciting to begin with uh obviously the the grant uh Giannis fight but they didn't mean a whole lot in the scheme of things and i obviously we have 42 fights 42 fight cards a year for the ufc alone but shouldn't we always have some takeaway? Shouldn't should uh, isn't that the whole point of the fight game is to move up and down the ladders and then make something happen? And it just this fight card was doomed to fail by the way it was set up. And like for instance, having Vieira Tate as the main event instead of Sean Brady Michael Chiesa. Yes, maybe for a rankings perspective, Vieira is ranked higher than Chiesa, but I don't think so. I think Chiesa was six, so it was just. The, the 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 deck was stacked against the fighters and i kind of feel for the fighters um i mean it, it was such a card that, that the ufc didn't even give out four bonuses i mean any any chance that the promotion is going to tape to be to, to be cheap they're they're gonna go ahead and, and, and run with that flag but i mean i'm kind of in the middle of both of you guys because this is going to happen in live sports not every NFL or NBA game is going to be exciting. Certainly no major league baseball game is exciting. I think we can, we can establish that uh, certainly never existed a soccer game. that's exciting. So some sports are just inherently boring, but I, I, I digress. Like it's going to happen. Like we have, we have boring combat sports from time to time. And when you're running so many events, it's going to happen. Now, Jay, to your point, you make an excellent point about this being set up for failure. The thing is though, every week, just about the UFC sets itself up for failure every week. Just about the roster is set up to fail by odd matchmaking or putting people in places where they don't belong or um, just a whole bunch of newcomers and nobody ever really cares about. And, and, and that's that, but what saves it a lot of times, especially during this, this 10 week stretch that we just went through is that there will be exciting fights. There will be something that distracts from the fact that, that there are two fighters that you never heard of um, that that likely won't make it far into the UFC and they slaughtered each other in this bloodbath and everyone loved it. So that kind of takes the narrative away. Um, we didn't have that this time. We didn't have some ridiculous just just back and forth rock and sock and robots fight to point to and say, oh, see how the cards are so exciting. See how you just got to watch it first before you judge. What we had was a card set up to fail, and the action failed, as one could have predicted would happen at some point in time. So, when you, hey, like, like, like you guys said, if you run so many events a year, this is going to happen. It's just unfortunate. I mean, I was, um, it, it was, it was a tough one to get through, and and especially for someone who does not watch a lot of the stuff live anymore due to my own home um, household circumstances for the time being you know, to, to make the time to sit and watch it and like, Oh, well, I could have picked a better car to, to go ahead and plop my butt on the couch for. So there's that. And I think some of it also has to do with the opportunity cost. Like you look at, you look at a, a, a UFC card, you're going to have to devote six, seven hours to it. Period. At the end. It's all, that's all it is. Like it started at 3 PM on the East coast and ended at nine something. I don't actually don't, remember i didn't i usually talk about it but i i could probably pull up the the specific conversation to when it ended but it just wasn't it it it, it didn't hold your attention for too long yeah nine o'clock so six hours a six hour 11 fight event uh, on espn that didn't have to you know be wasn't beholden to espn tv so it should have had pacing but the pacing was a little flawed because of the the the, the terrence mckinney fight that fell out uh you know the, the main event wasn't supposed to be the main event. And we know that. And we, we kind of excused that. It was just a fight on the uh, the the Lad Dumont card. But then Tate tested positive for COVID. 
the whole thing shifted and they said, oh, we can make this a main event. Um, now, it's not a fight that makes sense. Just Jen, I'm gonna to, to if I if I can rant about this fight, it didn't make a lot of sense because Vieira's coming off a loss, a deflating, disappointing loss to Lena Landsberg, an, an overinflating loss to Lena Landsberg, a vi- <laughs> a a problematic, disappointing, I don't like it loss. I I know she missed there. weight. Yes, is what exactly. I meant by over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so there's they put Vieta in this high opportunity spot against a former champion. They're trying to rebuild up. And now the UFC sets itself up in a predicament where they have a contender now, apparently, that's on a one-fight win streak, which is enough to get a title shot, asked Juliana Pena, who's fighting Amanda Nunes next month. Uh, the upside wasn't that high. So this is, the, this is the question that we look at about these kind of fight cards, that the best possible outcome is that Misha takes two wins away from, from, from fighting Amanda Nunes again. And yes, former champions get more opportunities to fight for gold but say we say this fight had happened and tate had won the third round two or something like that and so you scored it three to two tate and tate wins a close decision well then what do you do she barely skirted by a woman that can't seem to make it weight in a division who is struggling against the top of the division are we really going to be like yes let's put tate against amanda nunez again it was five years ago, but I think it would happen even worse in the first meeting. So I, I don't know. I just, the best possible thing that could happen was not that special. And we didn't get that. Do you not think they would have uh, stuck Tate into an immediate title shot if she had won in uncontroversial fashion? They would have tried. And I wouldn't have liked it because she would have been, what, three, four fights away from getting utterly destroyed by Amanda Nunes. Because, yes, it was back in mid-2016, mid but she was away from 2016 to 2021. So maybe the UFC could hope that it was out of the people's collective consciousness. But wins over Marion Renault and Kathleen Vieta to get a title shot against Amanda Nunes. What a step up in competition that would have been. But it, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Like that—that's the thing with yeah. with Amanda Nunes as champion. It it just doesn't matter. We're having the same conversations about whoever's lined up to fight Shevchenko. Like we're not giving anyone a serious chance at beating the champion. And not I gave, divisions, I gave so. Andrade the chance, and I was what, so I mean, wrong. She had a bunch so of in that, but, but 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 I mean, but after her, like who? And saying, and we've we've had this conversation with Nunes long ago. Like after, what was the last time we felt there was an actual challenge to to Amanda Nunes as champion? Durant, uh, maybe uh, on, know, the, on the feet at least. Yeah. So, yeah, and we're. I, we're I, I still think Durant has the best chance of of beating her. Anybody right. who's out there right now, I think yeah. you're right. So this this is what we're talking about here. So at this point, it's just get a warm body in front of Nunez. And Tate would certainly sell more than Vieira. So, of course, they would have put her in there. And it wouldn't have been warranted. And same thing if Vieira got, got the spot. It wouldn't have been warranted, but it would have been a fresh matchup. So they could try to market it that way. That's really all this is about. This was this was setting up who Amanda Nunez is going to thump on next. Um, and, and this, and even if, and even if, um, on the off chance that Julian Pena wins, um, next week, like Tate had history with her too. So you were looking, you were looking at some scenario where you can just plug Tate in at somewhere, in some way, say, perform if she wins. But clearly that conversation means nothing because she did not win. So, and, and then you look at a guy like Sean Brady, who's 15 and 0, five wins in the UFC. The, 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 the last two are the impressive ones. Kiesa and Jake Matthews, those are the ones that really stand out. Um, you know, Nardiev was a good contender. Uh, Court McGee was a good litmus test to see if you're ready for the division. And Christian Aguilera, I think that was a, re, uh, a, a, a fight that was a replacement fight. So I don't believe that was the initial matchup. But then you got Sean Brady. He's on a five-fight win streak, you know, just took out a top 10 guy. And he's still how far away from a title shot? Just it's it's tough to see that a division like uh, uh, bantamweight for 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 Nunez and getting another challenger that somebody like Sean Brady is just so far away. Now, I got to ask you guys a question because I'm curious about this. I've been chewing on this for a while. Brady's 15 and 0, and we know the other hot prospect at 170. We we know who he is, and people really want to talk about him. Leon Edwards. Ha- 
and he just he just needs a couple more. See, is he a prospect anymore? I feel like I he's just, like <laughs> I feel like he's I feel like he's like a guy in like the interweight contender series level right now. Um, I that Shemayev guy we know Hamza Shemayev. Uh, we saw him wrestle. Uh, 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 um, oh, Jack um, Hermanson the other yeah. day It was actually a good a good match. Hermanson didn't he did it well. He he got out of some of the messy situations. Did well in the second round. Shemayev still handled him. Who is the the these the Hansel's so hot right now kind of guy at 170? Is Sean Brady getting some of that heat, or is it still Shamayev is the big prospect to watch out for? Because my very biased thoughts, as I break Ant right now, my very biased thoughts are I think Sean Brady's got a brighter future at 170 than comes out Shamayev. Um First off, I just watched Zoolander again like a couple weeks ago, so that reference was spot on fresh. Um, I'm not mad at that. Like The thing is, Sean Brady has a more proven track record. He's someone who clearly can get it done against the division elite. Kamzat Shemaev, on the other hand, just has the dazzle that we've seen. We've seen the, we've seen the dazzle. If the dazzle has any real substance to it, then he will certainly – eclipse sean brady as far as uh his worth as as a prospect but if we're just going smart money with the things that we've seen in the cage and and not the marketing machine sean brady is i'd put up put up higher than Shemayev easily what is what is this a podcast for ants God, it is a podcast for ants <laughs> you know what one right here i i Right now, Brady is ranked higher than uh, Shamayev in Sherdog's rankings. I like that because he has accomplished more to this point. Uh, Matthews and especially Kiesa are better wins than Shamayev has. Having said that, even though I'm wary of hype trains in general, and even though I've been high on Brady like since his UFC debut, I think Shamayev has the higher ceiling, and I think Shamayev would win head-to-head. Uh, the things Brady does best do not line up well with the things Shemayev does best. And Brady has shown that carrying the muscle he does and running the grappling heavy style he does uh, can be tired out in a three round fight. Those, I, I, I think those both point to death against Shemayev. I, I think Shemayev would slaughter him if they fought head to head. Now to counter that one part about the, the energy for, for later in a fight, Shemayev appeared to me to be fatiguing in the, what was it? Six minute wrestling match with Jack Hermanson. The second round, he was all defense. He was defending well, but he was not the the blitz destroyer of worlds that he was before. And that that honestly, that I learned something about Shemayev I hadn't learned from his blitzings of the other guys before. Now, I, I, I Sean Brady obviously has the better wins. Sean Brady has a guy a win over Jake Matthews, who ten aided uh, Li Jing Liang in in their fight. So he has a win over the, the best guy that Shemayev has beaten, and he has a very impressive win after going through some adversity over Kiesa. I mean, granted, this was K one Michael Kiesa in the third round, apparently, but this was a this was the kind of thing that made me more comfortable in Brady as a prospect that if things don't go his way that if he doesn't get the takedown if he finds himself in trouble if this or that or the other thing he can get through it he can he can do the offense and he can survive well enough on the defense to to get through now would a better striker like say a Vincente Luque have knocked his block off maybe because Kiesa is not obviously known for his striking, and he was clearly marking Brady up. I still, for the time being, based on level of competition and what we've seen, have more confidence in Brady because Shamayev is not going to be able to do what he's doing to top 15 guys. He's just, I, I, I can't see him walking down and nuking Kiesa. I can't see him going and was stepping. Was Jing Liang not a top 15 guy? Was he at the time? If he was, I don't know if he should have been. Maybe because of the the, the Santiago Ponzinibbio win, but you know the, the the top fifteen status is a little questionable there. Um, but maybe, and and uh, like he's not going to be able to go and, and just lamp Neil Magny. Like Bala Muhammad is not just going to go down when he gets. I can think of all the fighters that Shemaev has to face and seeing what he's doing. He's a top ten guy right now. 
the UFC has Hamza Shumayev as the number 10 welterweight in the world. And Sean Brady is 14. Uh, and see, yeah, that that's that's ridiculous based on accomplishment. Exactly. I think I think uh, right now Shredog has Brady like number seven just because he had to move ahead of Kiesa yes. and Shamaya was like fourteen or something. Something like that. Yeah, I, but I mean, with the the level of uh, of marketing behind Shamayev, this we know what's going on. We we know. I mean, this is a year ago they were trying to fast track him to a title shot. Um, by fighting Leon Edwards. Yeah, they matched him against Lee. He had a fight with Leon Edwards on the books. Yeah, scheduled like three, three times, times, I think. Yeah, so this was they, they, there's clearly we clearly know what the agenda is. We we know exactly what's going on here. So, um, but yeah, Sean Brady is much more proven at this point in time. All right, fellas, let's move on to our swing or miss portion of the show. Uh, Taylor Santos is next for Valentina Shevchenko. Swing. She got a win streak. She's a new face. She can hurt people. They can sell that she's possibly a dangerous competitor. She did horrible things to, by the way, 500 uh, Joanne Calder, which she's seven and seven in the UFC. That's a, that's a bit. She knocked the Calder right out of her. She knocked the Calder right out of her and, and, you know, almost made me call her that like Sinead Kavanaugh or Connor. It's just, you know, they're dying for new blood because they don't want to make her fight. They don't want to make Shevchenko fight Maya. Or, or whomever again, or Lauren Murphy again. So even though she's number 10, lamping number five, that means she's probably number five. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say she's just, does, actually, does Val have a fight lined up yet? No. Because she's beaten Andrade, she's beaten Chukagian, she's beaten Murphy, she's beaten Maya, Wood was five, and Santos beat five. So yeah, that's probably it. You know what? One, I, I said this on the both the preview and the recap for this event. I was wrong about Tyler Santos. You know, and I won't even rehash the whole Astrophyte team prospect fallacy because she's the exception that, that proves the rule because it's it's still a true thing. But she's she's made it through her first couple of UFC fights. She's made it through her first couple of USADA tests, and she appears to be, if anything, better than ever. Uh, I saw some people already on Twitter saying that you know she's the the person who has the best chance of beating Shevchenko in the division. I'm not sure about that, but I stepped out on my own limb because I watched her during the fight and I said, who does this performance remind me of? And I'm not saying she's as good or ever will be as good, but I was like, th this is like an Amanda Nunes type performance where she just blasted Joanne Wood at Wood's supposed strengths. And then once it went to the ground was completely venomous. It was, it was about like watching Nunes run through uh, Tate, honestly. Um, I think she'll be next and it'll be too early. It'll be too much too soon. It'll ruin what could have been a better fight and a better, uh, rivalry, even just a year down the road, but somebody is going to end up with their head on the chopping block too soon. And if it's not her, it's going to be Miranda Maverick or Aaron Blanchfield or someone who's even younger and less proven. So if somebody has got to die, like if there, there needs to be a body for the wood chipper in early 2022, might as well be Santos, who's already a 20 fight veteran. You know, that that's all you can really say about it. It, it. It's not like there's this is a division devoid of prospects. It's just that there are a couple that are not quite far enough along that they've even ripened as a challenge for Shevchenko. Yeah, I, I don't think I could really add anything more to, to what you guys said. That's perfectly stated. So um, let's keep things pushing here because the um, rather – slow and uneventful UFC event from Vegas this past weekend did produce one of those things that just make you say, damn you MMA. Uh, and that, um, that comes courtesy of Mr. Cody Durden, who uh, picked up a unanimous decision win, but instead of just, you know, being gracious in, in his, in his victory and just saying, Hey, I won the fight, you know, congrats to my opponent. And I'm I'm gonna screw his name up. Um, so gentlemen, please help me with what with, with his name. Is it uh um Ori Quang Lang? Ori Chi Lang. Ori Chi Lang, okay. Um his his uh Chinese bred opponent, Ori Chi Lang, who I think is originally Mongolian, if if I'm if I'm not uh, well, mistaken. Inner Mongolia, so he yeah. is from China. But okay, yeah. all right. Um instead of just saying, Hey, um, you know, my opponent gave me a tough fight, he says uh he's gonna send him back to China where he came from. Um, Cody uh, doubled down on these racist remarks 
in the post fight interviews, um, you know, backstage saying that, you know, hey, he didn't he didn't care if you were offended and do something about it, et cetera, et cetera. Now for the UFC's portion in this, I mean, what do you think the promotion does uh, about uh, Durden's obviously uh, bigoted remarks? I I do need to, to say something on this. I made the mistake and I need to apologize. I know that a number of the viewers of this show are also viewers of the Zerdog previews and recaps. I can tell that just from the comments on the recap after UFC fight night 198, this was brought up in the chat and I watch UFC events with the sound off for the most part. I only run the sound if there's a replay so I can understand why they're replaying and what's going on. Um, and in the immediate aftermath of the show, only having seen the transcript of what he said, I, if not defended, at least said, I kind of want to wait and hear and see about context. Cause yeah, I had to beat this guy and send him back to China. I'm like, Ugh. I mean, that's definitely racist if he was Korean or if he's like Chinese American, but you know, this is no different than I'm going to send him back to Russia or I'm going to send him back to Philly. But no, I, I was wrong. I don't know why I bother giving MMA fighters the benefit of the doubt when stupid shit comes out of their mouth, but this was a, a mistake on my part because not only did he just double down and assure us that, no, no, I really meant this in a racist way, but then, of course, uh, I believe it's Matt Wells, the the wise and beneficent Matt Wells, who said it perfectly, the mask always comes off, and sure enough, his oh, his God. Twitter feed is just full of, like, racist humor specifically against asians and uh, as the only asian born member of this panel i'm especially embarrassed that i opened my mouth to defend cody fucking durden what a fucking moron what will the ufc do normally i'd say they'll do fucking nothing to quote you know uh, another man known for saying controversial things but in this one case think of what the ufc has done to uh, accommodate China in general. <laughs> oh, that's a really good point. I mean, I'm, I'm. It's not the same sport or the same organization, but I'm thinking of like John Cena apologizing for calling Taiwan a country right now. Yeah, yeah. I didn't you, even think about that. Yeah, you're making you're making a good point, and I think I think what makes it really crazy too was that this was on the ESPN broadcast. This yeah. wasn't. It's this wasn't um you know granted his Twitter feed is a is a cesspool oh my God. of idiocy, but it wasn't that it, it it wasn't that 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 was in the spotlight. It was on ESPN Plus through their broadcast. ESPN parent company Disney, Disney actually just went through a ton of hell trying to yeah. get Shang Chi played yep. in Chinese theaters because of the stars' comments about about the government there and whatnot, and they've they've edited movies and stuff to tailor toward um the chinese government and whatnot this could actually turn into something that otherwise would have flown under the radar if he said it about a black guy if he said it about hispanics or, or, or something to to that effect but one thing we can say for sure is cody durden is a fucking idiot he is a fucking idiot um jay anything you'd like to add when he said what he said there's no good way to really say it. I'm going to send him back to China where he's from. Or the, the, the exact words are, you know, the, the, the point is the, the racist trope of a phrase, I'm going to send him back where he came from. Uh, beat a black fighter, send him back to Africa, blah, blah. You've heard the horrible racial trope that comes for years. For years and years and years, this is no different, unfortunately, for, for, for Cody Durden. And to come and say, yeah, I said what I said. You want something? You want you want a step to me? Sign the contract. As if he's trying to use this as a negotiation tactic and or something to to draw an opponent to fight him, to challenge him for what he says, as if to make it a political issue, which it ain't. Like this is there. There's no two. Both sides have valid points in this situation. There's no like the 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 the, the preview or the recap show that you you had, Ben. Unfortunately, you're. Um, your your co-host was very light on on weighing in on it and kind of saying that I can see it being not racist. Unfortunately for him, this isn't the case. There's no there's no historical context. There's no justification. There's no oh I only meant to say where he came from. No, 
because a couple weeks before the fight, he said, I'm going to beat that communist. He said all these things about Asian people. He said all these things about uh, Dragon Balls and equations and all these historical things that he's said for a very long time. So there is no wiggle room. There is no everybody saying racist things, every, everybody's so sensitive. No, there has to be a line. There can't not be a line. Because it isn't about you saying the thing and going, I didn't think to be racist. If somebody hears you say something and goes, hey, that's racist against my people, that's it. That's the end of it. There is no, I didn't mean it, I did whatever. No, because it's not what you say. You, your intentions mean nothing. Because you said the comments, you insulted the community, you, you went after him and whatever people... And you have a long history of going after people. How many N words does this guy have in his Twitter feed history? Oh, he makes Mike Tons. Perry look like Nate Corey. He makes <laughs> Mike Perry look like yes. That, that's uh, be, I, you got you got a better person. I was going to say I was going to say Stephen Thompson, but yes, um, you know anti gay comments, anti everybody comments, and it is it is a very particular lane of of hate. It is it is it is. To the line that you will, you know, you heard the word, you hear, you heard what people classify them as, and you might not be wrong based on what he has said. So the UFC, to, to answer the initial question, what should the UFC do? Cut him. We don't, we don't take this. We don't, we don't have this. Here is our code of conduct, which specifically says racially insensitive language, and all of the other things that tie in that he has said. And just said, it is you're not digging through old Twitters when you go Cody Durden and you type in the N word and hey look there's all his N words. You're not even having to dig. You're looking at what he said on Saturday night about Chinese people and and in a pattern, a history of the things he's said. So that has to be the end of it because he didn't own up. He didn't apologize. He didn't even do anything besides say, I apologize if I offended anyone. That's the not, not, even, are, not even the usual non-apology. That is the exact words. <laughs> I'm reading the words from his Twitter. That's the exact words he used. They have to take a stand. And Ben, I didn't even think of the Disney, China, ESPN issue, situation there. That apps in the and and UFC Shanghai uh Performance Institute and all of the market there that absolutely this is a guy who should not be in the UFC. What will the UFC do? Dana has liked to try and claim free speech, but here's the problem. He's not a government. The UFC is not a public institution. The UFC is a private company. ESPN, its broadcast partner, and, and Endeavor, the owner, are private companies. They can regulate speech however they want, however they please. So if Dana tries to say just fighter saying things, well, he's out of his mind because it's not because he's not a this First Amendment does not apply to the private sector, Dana White. It's a very, very simple thing here. Um, so what will they do? I think might they might actually very quietly release him and say, dude, we don't we can't we can't do this. And here's why he's not popular. He's not a hot shot. If this Conor isn't Rare, Conor McGregor saying not, yeah. this. Conor it's McGregor said these things. They would have yeah. said, "Well, look, blah blah blah," and 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 well, Conor actually, we have this when Conor McGregor repeatedly called Floyd Mayweather "boy," which mm -hmm. we know the history and context of that, and then when uh like this is this is he's not a money, he's not an entertaining fighter. Like his fight was not a barn burner, so they can't go. Oh well, the fight made up for it. There's nothing about him that should keep him on the so, roster. So, so and, not uh, even the Jeremy Stevens defense. Yeah, it's or, not or, even, or the Mike Perry defense. It's like, not, yeah. none yeah. of the above. So <laughs> I, I can't, I can't see Cody Durden getting another UFC fight. You know what you he should have said? Anything. He should have said no. He should have said, said, said nothing. Well, he no, should have gotten the black belt. Does he have a black belt? Does he? Ha no, he does not. He's got like the white belt with like one stripe, and like. It's probably a gift belt. No, he should have said, I'll send him back to China where the competition's easier because that would have been a nice old school lace and strictly speaking true. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I mean, his <laughs> black his black belt is as... Because of WLF. His, his black belt is as legitimate as uh, Trump's Taekwondo black belt. Um, did, like, did he say... 
<laughs> but um, <laughs> you know what? So, so a couple a, a couple of things to to Please. to say in in response to it before we move on because we Please. granted we don't have a whole lot of topic, but we don't have a lot of time either. Um, Gina Carano, um, famously dropped from the cast of a very very popular Disney run show. Yep because of things that she said on social media on social media not on a disney platform mm -hmm. um i can't imagine cody durden if the ufc is is got the slightest bit of pressure from their broadcast partners who are bankrolling that company right now with what 10 million per event uh in, a, in addition to a very very handsome uh check that they receive for every pay-per-view i can't imagine any pressure on, on them and they stand up for cody durden at all um, I think the best case scenario for him might be that they do what they've done to fighters who have exercised their free speech in regards to unions for fighters. And that's give them the absolute worst matchmaking possible, like they did with, with Cajun Johnson. Cajun Johnson. Give, give him the yeah. worst matchmaking possible, and the moment he loses, goodbye. Leslie Smith. Exactly. So, or, or any sort of discrepancy where – a fighter, you know, you have valid reason to not take a fight. Okay, you're cut. Um, that's that could be a, a likely scenario for him. I certainly don't want to ever see him in, in the octagon again. He is a great a moron. Um, and I hope he hears this. So uh there's that. Now, fellas, um, let's move on briefly to shallow cuts here. Let me start my clock at 30 seconds. Um Jay, I'm going to Leave it in your hands right now. Who gets what question? Um, so take it away, my man. All right. All right. Let's see. Um, we kind of covered this one, so I'm going to skip past this one. I'm going to keep it specialized to your own interest instead of screwing it up and making it so you answer a question that you're not as. So I'm going to ask Ben a question, and it's about a local fighter that he probably should know a lot about. Adrian Yana is one of the possible biggest stock up fighters of the fight card besides Tyler Santos, I would argue, and maybe Sean Brady, um, I believe it was Bala Muhammad and some other fighters chimed in afterwards that claimed Adrian Yanez has the best boxing in the UFC. Now, are those calls very premature or are they actually onto something? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I don't know if he's the best boxer in the UFC, but it's not ridiculous to say it. He's certainly in the team photo for it. I, <laughs> If not, who's the best boxer in the UFC? Is it Max Holloway? Is it Peter Yan? Because if you think it's Peter Yan, understand that this summer, Adrian Yanez was brought up to Sarah Longo for Aljamain's fight camp to simulate Peter Yan. Uh, I would have no problem calling him one of the five best boxers in the UFC. And to say that of a 27-year-old who's only been in the UFC for like three fights, that's pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, like he, it's not ridiculous. I like it. Now, I guess we'll, we'll save the, the boxing one for later. So, Ant, you saw the fight card. You know it was very unexciting. It, it, it didn't deliver very much. And as I mentioned, the UFC decided only to give out three post-fight bonus checks. Performance of the night to Tyler Santos and fight of the night to Adrian Yanez and David Grant. Did the, should, should the UFC have scrimped on this by holding a bonus back? Or should they always reward performances and, and bonuses accordingly? Uh, my answer is neither. They should not be on the show win system. They should just pay fighters a flat fee, and then there's there's not necessarily a need for a bonus. Um, you just incentivize fighters to just fight and and, and put on their best performance. Um, I, I but they really shouldn't have scrimped on this one. Like, just go ahead and pay it. It's this isn't breaking the budgets. They just released information last week about this being like the best quarter that the that the UFC has ever had, and now you can't pay someone fifty k stupidity i hate it i like it now me i'm going to give myself a very handsome question and talk about a guy who i had locked as the winner for this fight card that one of the most confident fighters i thought would get the win would be honey yaya against kong no kong uh mr perfect honey yaya is a specialist he 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 is a submission grappler that's going to do that until the wheels fall off so me is Hani Aya one of the most underappreciated specialists in the sport right now? Underappreciated is the that I should add that to his nickname. 
for or add him a nickname on Sherdog sure Fight Finder because of how little love and respect that Hanyaya gets. Everybody respects and understands Damian Maya. You know, great boxers, Max Holloway, best boxer, all that kind of thing. But Hanyaya has done most of the things, fought most of the opponents that he could possibly face, and he hasn't even slipped and fallen into a TKO win. So he is criminally underappreciated, and I love him for it. I mean, that's not even a big enough question. He's one of the most underappreciated specialists of all time in MMA. Yes, because when you think when you think of the most dangerous grapplers in the in the sport, you go Maya, Jacare, Verdum. You think of those names. Hani Yaya has to be in the conversation, not just because the ability to take a neck or something is that he can take anything. He can hit anything. He can go for a north-south in a transition, or he can suddenly fall over on his back and hit a heel hook. Or then suddenly, oh, you know, I got this. I got your wrist. I have one hand on your wrist. I'm going to turn this into a Kimura and yank it. He can do all of the things. And that's something we don't see. And 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 the fact that he doesn't even bother trying to pound you out and just says, I want the limb, that has to deserve something. Well, I mean, I think when you you mentioned Maya, you mentioned Verdum, you mentioned Jacare, the thing that they have over Hanayaya are successful results in the cage um, on a championship level. Like Maya's twice been a title challenger. Um, Jacare was a strike force champion. Verdum, um, UFC champion, you know, upset fate or blah, blah, blah. Like Hani Yaya hasn't had that definitive moment. Like he's done well and he's maintained a, a long career and certainly deserves his respect, but he's never been able to break that barrier to, to title contendership. So I think that's really why um, we overlook him in those conversations. It's yeah. it's part of it, but yeah. the guy's like 13 and four in the UFC right now. Yeah. And he came to the UFC after some people thought his prime w- was probably already on its way out. I mean, he was all already like almost 30. And part of it is that just he's kind of like a goofy and comical little guy. So it's just easy to kind of forget, you know, his uh, his impressive results. Like, yeah, I, I've underappreciated him for a long time. And, and he fought for a WEC title a long time ago. Yeah. And that, that that doesn't really, you know, this was this was pre, I think it was the Bantamweight title. So it was pre Faber and all that. Kind yeah. Of. All yeah. right. Yeah, I did. I did forget that. That's way, way back it's, in the archives. Okay. It's a long time ago. All right, fellas, let's keep things pushing here. Um, so let's move on to the best title segment in all of media history. I'm not surprised, Mr. Falcons. Uh, this is where we share something that surprised us, or ironically, did not over the course of the past week. Very quickly, because we are super, super short on time. Ben, what's your "I'm not surprised, Mr. Falcons" moment this um, week? Um, I I will pass the mic. I don't have anything in particular this week. Oh, Jay, man. I know you got something. I have something. I have three, but I'm going to go with one. So the other fight card we haven't really touched on is that Ryzen 32 happened in Okinawa, which is very interesting since it's the first major fight card in Okinawa, I believe. I don't think that Ryzen or Pride or Dream had fight cards in that little island. Uh, if I'm wrong, then that's just what happens sometimes in MMA. Um, you know, big, not a huge blockbuster fight card. And for some reason, Ryzen decided to populate it with people 45 and older. Just a, this was a Legends Tours Legends Tour. It was a very strangely match made card. And one fight that happened was a very unusual one between a 40 year old Shinya Kumazawa, who is a just a longtime martial artist with a sub 500 record, against a kid from California that's 25 that I found like his camo, which is California amateur records is very spotty and sometimes it says he fought in three cards on the same night which is impossible logistically and everything like that so a lot of weird stuff he couldn't spell the word college in his own bio- biography so weird what is he doing in rise and fighting a 40 year old so he's fighting a 40 year old that is wearing a martial arts gi in mma competition it is sleeves cut off uh i think it i think it had knees cut off too um and so this guy is the first fighter i can think of that fought an MMA fight in the past 15 years with the Gi. And so what this, this, this California kid decided to do, you got a Gi, you have something for me to hold on to. I'm going to take advantage of that. And so what he proceeded to do for the first round and much of the second until something happened, he proceeded to get the Gi to choke his opponent out with his own Gi. So it, in in the grappling world, it's called a bow and arrow choke. 
uh, which is to, to get and basically get the collar to, to, to cut off your own wind supply and choke you out with your own thing. So he hoisted him on his own petard. It was absolutely spectacular, and I am here for it. Ryzen, do that. This is your lane. We love you for it. I am all aboard that weird wagon. All right, not a bad one there. Uh, my I'm not surprised isn't really a true I'm not surprised, but I, I would feel bad if I didn't mention this at all on the show. The best thing that happened in combat sports over, over the week was uh, Terrence Crawford and Sean Porter in a fantastic fight. Sean Porter retired after losing TKO in, in the 10th round. Great stoppage, and I'm not surprised that boxing did a stoppage properly. Uh, his, uh, his father, um, uh, Sean Porter's father and trainer, Stopped the fight once he got dropped twice by Crawford in a in a pretty pretty crazy sequence. Uh, Porter retired immediately after the fight, so uh, congrats to him on a good career. Uh, one of the nicer guys, I think, too in in combat sports. But just um yeah, just wanted to highlight that, and that was certainly the high point for me um in the fight world this weekend. If there is a if there is an I'm not surprised, Mister Falcon segment. It's what Porter's dad said after the fight. Yes absolutely yes. Yes. you if, if if he threw him under the bus that big nog was driving when it was trying to chase down a carrot like i can't believe <laughs> how badly he just obliterated his boy that was just planning to retire he this was the anti chris wyman's dad he's still my boy this yeah. was the he had a bad camp he didn't he did this has not really in it absolutely just hilarious and i uh did you did if there's any are there any thoughts you had on that? Oh, I thought that was go. that was fantastic. I mean, it would have and, and that makes sense for the corner to stop it the way they did. If if he didn't feel like he was properly uh prepared for it, why risk further damage? And especially knowing that he was considering retirement beforehand, that like, okay, let's we don't need this extra damage. And he had already proven himself to be tough as nails in that fight and had some very good moments against Crawford as well. Um, another um, another evisceration with the the subject standing right next to you. post fight press conference, Terrence Crawford Bob, just Bob Arum. embarrassed the crap out of Bob Arum as he ends his contract with top rank. That was his final fight um, with <laughs> Arum. And he just made it very clear, hey, Bob Arum couldn't get the Spence fight going with me. He damn sure ain't going to get it without me. So goodbye. And what a what a what a sign off. <laughs> for a senior at top rank so easily right, so one of the best one two post fight interview oh segments just fantastic oh. Fa fantastic back-to-back -back, uh in entertainment there on the mic all right fellas so um we don't have a fight card this weekend this is a major fight card i think one championship has something that was probably it's, it's taped, taped sometime away. last no year yeah it was taped sometime last year yeah it was, um, it was taped last month they're still putting the cgi on it now <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, now let's let's just share something that we are thankful for and not thankful for in this sport as we wrap things up before the holiday. Ben, what are you not thankful for and what are you thankful for? Well, I am thankful that I get to do what I do for a living. I've you know been in uh MMA media for you know uh going on four years now. It's uh just coming up on two years that I've done this as my like primary main source of, of income. I, I will never, I, I'll never be over this. I'll never not be thankful that I get to do this. You know, um, I, I recognize that it's special and that it's frankly rare. There, there's a limited number of people who work in MMA media full time. Uh, so always thankful for that. Having said that, I'm also thankful that I get a week off this week. And that's sort of the implied what I'm not always thankful for. You know, it, it is a grind when you do it for a job. I'm I'm happy to have a week off to spend with my family and just turn my journalistic eye backwards where my real labor of love is. I'm more of a historian and a storyteller than a prognosticator and a newsman. So I'll get to write some cool old school articles this week. Very nice. Jay, what are you not thankful for and are thankful for? I'm not thankful for organizers and those in the in the sport that don't allow it to be a <clears throat> to be a well-oiled machine like ideally this is the kind of thing that should be a, a an assembly line of coverage whether it's a major promotion or it's even something an nfc in georgia you know national fights you just a it's anything like that it should be a system that it's you do this then you do this and then you go here and you're done 
and so and some organizers decide we're going to not make it quite as easy or transparent or or questionable to cover it from a media perspective or, or, or any kind of perspective like that. I, I'm, I don't appreciate any kind of obfuscation because it's it it all should be public information. It's like any other sport. Any other sport would be the game happens and it happens and there it is and we did it and then the the Rams beat the Titans or whatever and here's all the information. So for a fight company to 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 just decide we're going to change things up because we want to be better than another organization, I don't I'm not I don't thank you. I don't there's no reason for that. There's no reason to to make things difficult. But on the other hand. I am thankful for things that are well oiled, well oiled machines. Things that are regular, they're they're consistent. They don't involve prunes, so it's not like that. It's it's just a a comfort, a a normal good thing to have that I look forward to all the time. And that's you guys. Uh, I'm thankful for you boys and and the show that we have here. Uh, the audience, you you guys are great. If if you tune into this, and if not, then you should be tuning into this. People that aren't listening to this, obviously, that's how I get you. It's 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 a kind of a release from from the sports. It's very cathartic. I say this to you guys all the time. Oh, I feel better after this. I feel better ranting about Cody Durden being an idiot because yes, to- Cody Durden's an absolute unabashed idiot. And I have to say something. And I say something, and then my day's better. So to be able to have this show with you boys and and talk about the things we we genuinely like, and and it's not a job like you like I thought it would be. Like I, I also like like Ben. I cover the sport full time, and I came into it from a very different background, and I expected it to be a slog, and sometimes it is. And we need this week off because I'm very burned out. But to have this little slice of happiness with you guys, uh, I'm I'm very grateful that we we do this. Very, very well said, gentlemen. Um, I'll say what I'm not thankful for first. I'm not thankful for the fact that we can't just stick to sports. I get told that a lot. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the personalities um, surrounding this sport, a lot of the toxic fan base don't allow us to just do that, because I would love to just talk about the fights, the business implications, the who's in the rankings and who gets the title shot. That would be the dream. But unfortunately, that's not the world that we live in. And we live in this world in addition to the fight. So we just got to talk about it all as, as a whole and how one plays into the other. Um, I'm not thankful for that part, but I accept it as, as part of the job. What I am thankful for, uh, for sure, you two gentlemen, um, uh, because I simply like when when I got laid off from Sure Dog, when the, the California law changed, I was at a point where I just wasn't sure if I was going to keep doing this. I was always going to keep watching. I was always going to contribute in some way um, to the discourse because I enjoy it that much. But I was putting so much of my time and energy into um what i did at sure dog um i'm thankful that i did have that experience but man it took a lot away from my family it took a lot away from just my enjoyment of everyday life having this step away and still having that piece this piece of of content to put up has been marvelous it's kept me it's kept me involved it's kept me excited to the point where i i feel like i'm ready to jump back in the fray like i want to get back into covering things on a more regular basis so I'm 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 pushing myself out there for some more content going into uh, 2022, and I have you guys to thank um, to for keeping that that fire in me and seeing you guys thrive and do what you do is an inspiration. It's fantastic. I love it, and I love you guys. Um, and I think we should also give another shout out, another big thank you to Scott. Um, we see you in the comments every week loyal watching loyal listening and and thank you so much for all your compliments people like you or what keeps us um happy to do this like we don't get a lot of views and that's fine um but the views that we get mean something yeah and you are a, a perfect representation of that so thank you scott and, and thank you to everyone like you so i think that's an appropriate place to end things this week on unleash um remember to like subscribe share tell a friend to tell a friend tell that friend to tell to more friends check ben and jay out on sherdog.com you can find some of my old work at mma on point i'm looking to do some stuff for 270 um some video essay pieces if you have any ideas related to that go ahead and and hit me up um hit my twitter up hit me up in the comments 
And um, yeah, I'll take some ideas and, and see what, what, what more content you guys want to see. Um, but in the meantime, stay beautiful, stay positive, and stay sexy. I will see you when I see you. Peace.